All right. Um, well, again, welcome to our webinar today um, on reentry program models. Um, so, focusing today on returning citizens um, and community action. Um, so, just want to welcome you to today's event. And then we always like to start out our webinars with the promise of community action. Um, so Amy, if you'll advance to that slide with the promise. Um, everyone can kind of engage in this at your seat, wherever you're seated. Um, and then we'll move on with our webinar. So community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Amy Robert. She is our program associate on the Learning Communities Resource Center team. Um, I am Courtney Kohler. I'm a senior associate on the um, partnership TNTA team and um, serve with the learning community as well. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about our learning community and the learning community team, um, as well as what we're gonna cover in today's discussion. Thank you, Courtney. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with all of you. So the Learning Community um, is a program that um, helps to analyze community action outcomes and identify effective, promising, and innovative practice models that alleviate the causes and conditions of poverty. So we are a resource network for all of you who work in community action agencies. And the Learning Community Resource Center team, uh, we have Tiffany Marley, the Director of Practice Transformation, Hyacinth McKinley, who is the Senior Associate, Lil Dupree, uh, Senior Associate for Research, and Co Courtney Kohler, who is here on this webinar, uh, Senior Associate for Training and Technical Assistance, Kevin Kelly, the Director of Community Economic Development, Liza Porras, a program associate for training and technical assistance. Jeannie Chaffin, a consultant with the Community Action Economic Mobility Initiative. And then myself, um, a new program associate with the Learning Communities Resource Center. So feel free to reach out to any of us with any questions or comments or concerns. So today's discussion will focus on incarceration today, um, and we will start with some facts about incarceration in the United States. And then we have three wonderful speakers who are with us today um, who will be presenting about their organizations um, that they work with in their own communities. Uh, so we have Ann Fisher from Virginia Cares, and Ann Fisher worked as a legal secretary from 1975 until 1989 for the FBI and the Department of Justice Fraud Section and uh, Facilities Engineers at Fort Meade, Maryland, Miles and Stockbridge in Baltimore, Maryland, and Woods Rogers in Hazel Grove in Roanoke, Virginia. She served with Total Action for Progress and Head Start in Community Development and Outreach from 1991 until 1996 in Virginia. And currently, Ann serves as Board Secretary for the Virginia Community Action Partnership. She was the Executive Assistant for Virginia Community Action Reentry Systems and became an Interim Director of Virginia Cares in 2002 and then Executive Director in 2003. She participated in the Governor Bob McDonald's Governor's Prisoner and Juvenile Reentry Council and is a senior member of PAPIS, Virginia's Reentry Coalition. And then we also have Christina Dillard from New Reentry, and she is uh, the Director of Training and Technical Assistance at the North Carolina Community Action Association. She manages the development, implementation, and assessment of training and capacity building activities for North Carolina Community Action Network agencies. And with formal training as a psychologist, Ms. Stillard also serves as an independent evaluator for federal grants. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from Concord University and a Master of Science degree in experimental psychology from Radford University. And then finally, we have Ms. Thelma French with the New Orleans Reentry Task Force. She is the President and CEO of Total Community Action of New Orleans. 
which helps to reduce poverty in communities through collaborating with other agencies and providing human services, experiences, and opportunities that move people from poverty to self-sufficiency. She has an extensive background in human services, professional development, and technical assistance. And she has many experience in uh, public administration, serving in positions with state, municipal, and school boards. And she is a member of the Community Action Partnership, the Alliance for Children and Families, Louisiana Workforce Investment Council, New Orleans Workforce Development Board, Association of Community Action Partnership of Louisiana, the New Orleans Parish Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee, and the New Orleans Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, as well as many other civic organizations. And then at the end of this webinar, we will have a panel discussion and question and answer. So with that, um, we will go into some of the incarceration facts and then hand it over to our presenters. All right. Well, thank you, Amy, um, for that, those introductions. Um, just want to give you kind of a picture of um, some of our incarceration facts in the United States before we get started to frame up. Um, what we'll be talking about and the importance of this um, information today. So um, what you see here on your screen, I'll just let you kind of take a look at it here for a moment, but um, basically this is showing how many people are incarcerated in the United States um, through state prisons, local jails, um, federal prisons and jails. And so you can kind of see those small slivers of the pie are broken out into the um, bar that is over at the side. Um, and so that brings out looking at youth centers, um, territorial prisons, immigration detention, um, involuntary commitment, and then there's some other um, Indian country and military down there as well. Um, and so you can also see they've broken it out into, you know, what type of um, you know, whether in the state prisons, you know, the drug property, um, violent crimes, um, whether in local jails, whether they're convicted or not convicted. So this just gives an um, interesting picture of, you know, who and, um, and why people are incarcerated in the United States. And up there at the top, it says the U.S. locks up more people per capita than any other nation at a staggering rate of 698 per 10 or 100,000 residents. But to end mass incarceration, we must first consider where and why 2.3 million people are confined nationwide. So that's kind of what this picture here is showing. Then these are just some incarceration trends in America. Um, between 1980 and 2015, the number of people incarcerated in America increased roughly from 500,000 to over 2.2 million. And then today in the United States, um, that makes up about five percent. The United States makes up about five percent of the world's population, um, but has 21 percent of the world's prisoners. Furthermore, one in every 37 adults in the United States, or 2.7 of the adult population, is under some sort of correctional supervision. Um, so looking at some of these stats, it can be a little bit staggering, especially seeing these increases over time. Um, and the percentages of, you know, population to um, even the world prisoners. And we have the sources here down at the bottom as well. Um, but there's also racial disparities in incarceration. So, um, and, and many, you know, understand and know this, but in 2014, um, African Americans constituted 2.3 million or 34% of the total 6.8 million correctional population. African Americans are incarcerated at more than five times the rate of whites, and the imprisonment rate for African American women, women is twice that of white women. Then this last chart here um, on poverty and incarceration um, just kind of shows the distribution of the annual incomes for incarcerated men prior to um, incarceration and then non-incarcerated men ages 27 to 42. Um, so you can just see kind of the difference here um, between incarcerated and non-incarcerated and then people, um, percent of people with that income.
And this is just a quote from Brian Stevenson. So the opposite of poverty isn't wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. And so this quote kind of grounds us in what we're talking about today. Um, and, and that is justice. Um, and so we're not necessarily always talking about, um, you know, of course, part of poverty is, you know, people being self-sufficient and having the money to thrive and survive. Um, but also it is about um, being able to uh, have justice in your life. And so um, that's part of what we're talking about today. And we know that there's so many factors that go into poverty um, and that, you know, money isn't just the solution. Um, and so we're going to talk about one of these issues today that definitely impacts poverty. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Amy and she'll go ahead and transition us over to our presenters for today. Okay, thank you very much, Courtney. So first we will have Ann Fisher with Virginia Cares. And with that, I will turn it over to Ann. And you might be muted on your phone end. We're not hearing you come through at the moment. I'm sorry. Let's try that. Is that better? There we go. There we go. Sure. We can hear you. This is Ann Fisher. I'm obviously technically challenged, um, but uh, uh, I've, as, as was mentioned in my bio, I've been with the agency for just over 20 years. Our agency is um, just over 35 years old, and we have been uh, during our time, there have only been three executive directors um, to this agency. Oddly enough, all of them women. But um, if you want to go to the next slide, we can uh, take a look at our mission statement. And the mission of Virginia Cares Incorporated is to lead a statewide network of reentry programs that promotes public safety by advocating for ex offenders and providing supportive services to help them live successful lives. We are a, um, we are, I subcontract my program out to six different community action agencies throughout the state of Virginia. So we are one, one of the only um, statewide programs uh, that handles reentry and that has uh, service delivery sites set up across our state. It is, yeah. See, we began as a life planning workshop with inmates in the Roanoke City Jails. Our um, office is, our central office, administrative office, located in Roanoke, Virginia. This is where we started under uh, what was then called Total Action for Poverty. It's now known as uh, Total Action for Progress. And we started with pre-release programs in the Botetot Correctional Unit. Um, TAP, as it's known, uh, Total Action for Progress, was a leader in developing programs um, that, that spun out on its own and became independent, Virginia Cares being one of them. Um, there's also a uh, post-secondary education program called Project Discovery that's a statewide as well in, in Virginia, and a water wastewater treatment that is actually a regional program. Um, we provide services for adult prisoners and returning citizens that are released from Virginia state institutions, local and regional jails, and federal prisons. Um, we, we are different from other members of our reentry coalition here in Virginia in that we do serve federal releasees. Uh, we use the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles uh, regulations to our residency regulations in order to establish whether or not an individual is, is a resident of the state of Virginia and we can provide them with service. Um, we have, uh, as you can see, we serve a total of 26 cities and towns and 32 counties in Virginia. We do that with an extremely small staff, but um, they do it very well. Next slide, please. When we do, when we do our program, um, we have certain steps that we take. We assess the new returning citizens who seek services within 12 months of having been released from a Virginia local or regional jail or state institution utilizing the OST, and that's an offender screening tool. It's a comprehensive risk and needs assessment that we conduct 
that determines the need for follow-up and what type of um, risk there the individual is at for recidivism and what types of interventions uh, will reduce that risk. Uh, we have a specific dosage um, chart that we use depending on their OAT scoring. Um, they, we then have the individual attend an orientation during which time they're asked to complete a background, background information, contact information, usual type of intake processes um, in order for us to enroll them in our program. We then place the person in the uh, service track that will provide them with the number of dosage hours um, that, that they will need to both achieve those goals that they have set out um, as well as to hopefully provide them with the support they need to prevent recidivism. Um, there are three categories of our services. The first is the emergency and stabilization, and you see that the O score on this is zero to six. These are individuals that usually have a good family support system or already have a job um, and, and just require some basic um, emergency services, temporary shelter, maybe some medical care with help with prescriptions, um, food, clothing for a job, that type of, of uh, that type of need. So next slide, please. We have uh, transitional reentry services. Those are um, provided for our medium risk individuals. These individuals are um, at low risk for recidivism. Uh, but don't have as much support in the community as somebody who qualifies as a low-risk individual. Um, and you can see that they, we, there's other services that are provided in addition to the emergency services that they can receive. Our intensive reentry services are, re are reserved for individuals who score at the higher risk levels. And these are broken down um, based on whether they are moderate, to high or moderate slash high risk or, mo or high risk slash high need. Individuals that are at the upper end of the uh, spectrum, high risk, high need, we tend to get into an area where uh, statistics have shown that services are not as uh, helpful to them as they would be to some of the individuals more in the middle area of, of their risk need assessment. Um, and, and we work with these individuals more on a one-to-one one, one basis in their case management, um, and we spend more time with them um, intervening with their employers into their family situation, maybe some of their court issues, in order to help them become more stabilized and um, not, not uh, reoffend. Each participant gets a case plan. We track their progress. They are reassessed at six-month intervals, and then we, if there is more than a two-point difference in their initial risk score, that, that's noted in, their, um, in the case management files. Next slide, please. These are, this is a kind of a brief capsule of the services that we provided in fiscal year 17-18. Um, we served uh, 426 pre-release individuals. Usually that just, our pre-release services usually just consist of going in and talking to groups about the program. It varies from institution to institution, depends on what the particular um, administration of that institution wants us to do. Some are very involved in the um, um, you know, re-entry process. They want a more in-depth uh, type of program given to them, and, and then others, other institutions are just interested in the basic information concerning our program. We served over a thousand. Um, we served over a thousand post-release participants last year. Again, our post-release participants cannot have been out for more than 12 months um, when they come to us. Uh, that that is the picture or the window that we have for individuals that we can do the most good for. Um, we, 466 of the individuals we served got employment, and 
we also task our staff with employer contacts. So we do keep track of the number of employers that they contact in their areas. Um, in our case management, um, career and family is an important part, in our opinion, of working with the individual and helping them to develop um, a career track, pursue what they want to do. We don't want our individuals to just find a job that just pays them enough to get by. We'd like to get them established in something they enjoy doing, something they're good at, and something that they can you know, move forward in and, and become well established in the community. Uh, financial assistance, obviously most of us have to provide that. Substance abuse referrals and housing referrals, financial referrals. Uh, we don't do any housing programs ourselves, so all of our housing is um, uh, done either through direct contact with landlords or through a referral process to housing um, services at other community action agencies or other resources in the community. Substance abuse, we have, we have no certified um, counselors or individuals on our staff, so all of our substance abuse treatment is done through a referral process to, to an organization somewhere in the community. And we always we have support groups. We use peer groups and job readiness workshops. We also have um, educational groups, where, which are similar to the peer group sessions, except that they are usually um, facilitated by an individual, a professional individual outside of our staff, such as you might have a banker come in to talk about banking and, and money management, or you might have somebody else come in to talk about um, uh, from, a, from a business about a particular job that they're looking for individuals for. We also have provide these uh, few services over la this again, it has to do with uh, fiscal year 17-18. Um, these are just various uh, miscellaneous services that we provided. We don't do as much assistance in obtaining identification anymore because in Virginia, the uh, department Motor Vehicles has worked out a program with the Department of Corrections that actually goes in, into the institution and provides identification cards for the individuals before they're released. So that's, that has been a help. That used to be a great expense for us um, as far as doing that. When night, in uh, the fiscal year 17-18, we also assisted 353 individuals through the process of applying for the restoration of their rights in Virginia. Um, the process has been simplified greatly, although it's still, individuals still lose their right to vote when they are convicted of a felony. So it's just a, um, that's, that's an area that we could get into. It would take a lot of discussion. These are our service delivery sites. Um, Hampton Roads, which is in uh, the Eastern Shore area, Lynchburg, New River Community Action, which is up around Christiansburg, Radford area. Um, People Incorporated, which serves a, a, has two service delivery sites. One is in the very far southwest portion of Virginia where there is the opioid crisis is extremely rampant. And the other one um, is up in the Fredericksburg area up in northern Virginia, much more, you know, much more dense population, not as rural an area. Um, next slide. We also have programs in Pennsylvania County. Again, this is a very rural area with very little employment. We, are, we have um, some very unique situations in that area. And then our TAP program has one both in the Roanoke City area and in a small uh, rural jurisdiction in Covington um, out towards the Appalachian area. Uh, I have some contact information on the slide, next slide for the individuals in our agency. We'll be glad to answer any questions later on that anybody has concerning our program and are more than happy to send information out if anybody's interested in the program. And that's all I have. All right. Well, thank you so much, Anne. We appreciate you sharing this information. And um, uh, we will hand it over to Christina Dillard with New Reentry. Um, so, Christina, you're welcome to jump in when you're ready. All righty. Thank you. And you can actually go ahead and go to the next slide. Thanks. 
Uh, well, on behalf of our Board of Directors and Executive Director, Sharon Goodson, thank you for the opportunity to share some information about our reentry work. Um, I do want to start by providing just a bit of background information around our work in the reentry space. Uh, because we have been at the table in conversations around reentry and justice reinvestment and opportunities um, since around 2005, 2006. I put 2008, but it was even before that, uh, really since our current executive director assumed her role. But through these initial conversations with entities such as the North Carolina Department of Public Safety, local community action agencies, other advocacy groups and organizations, um, energy was created around how we could better serve this population. And we know that for community action agencies, we have historically always served people transitioning home after incarceration. So discussions around how we could better serve people who are already showing up at our agencies and how we could uh, provide even better services and support were being had 10 plus years ago. Um, we were also involved in initial advocacy efforts, which ultimately resulted in the North Carolina Justice Reinvestment Act being passed back in 2011. So this passed with bipartisan support, and that act represented the most significant changes to our state's criminal justice sentencing laws since 1994. It was, um, again, had bipartisan support. And uh, it was a data-driven approach to criminal justice policy with the overarching goals of reducing recidivism, increasing public safety, and lowering corrections costs. So the idea was that the funds saved from these strategies were to be reinvested in, in reentry activities and other activities which make communities safer. And so um, these re justice reinvestment funds would, in part, provide funding to support research on reentry and funding for local reentry councils. And so then in 2012, uh, through a competitive RFP process, NCCAA was selected to conduct a comprehensive statewide reentry needs assessment. And this project involved identifying gaps in services and opportunities for targeted resource support in various communities across the state. And in the end of this process, NCCAA was selected to serve as uh, what's referred to as the intermediary agency. Essentially, we were selected to administer a tri-county reentry program. And at that time, there were five programs um, across the state. We were one of two tri-county initiatives, and I'll talk more about that a little later. Um, but um, I do, let me also share that those five sites were selected by looking at the data and seeing which communities across the state had the highest influx of individuals transitioning um, home after incarceration. So that's how those five sites were determined. We um, were selected to serve a tri-county area. And so on the next slide, I'll share with you the two main objectives of our program and what we were charged with doing. Um, but first, uh, again, we serve a tri-county area of Nash, Edgecombe, and Wilson counties. Thus, we use the acronym NEW for new reentry. And the two main objectives of our program are, one, to provide comprehensive uh, reentry case management, supportive services, and referral services, and also to provide strategic leadership to the local reentry council, which, as you might guess, is referred to as the new reentry council. And this model of not only providing direct services to clients, but also organizing and galvanizing a local reentry council can be very powerful um, as it creates opportunities, um, of, of course, to influence both family and community level changes. And so I'll share with you a bit more about our, uh, the structure of our local reentry council on the next slide. Thanks. And I hope you can see um, enough of this slide, but this is the framework that we were provided. This is the, um, the broad framework that every uh, formal reentry council in North Carolina uses. Um, you'll see in the, on the left-hand side, there's a definition of what a local reentry council is and um, 
on the left hand side you'll also see the purpose of the reentry council which is to bring together all stakeholders to offer assistance and resources to help formerly incarcerated individuals become productive citizens while reducing recidivism and victimization and so essentially we're using a collective impact model to support our um, families that we serve, but also intentionally working to create community level change. And to me, one of the most helpful components of this graph and one that we refer to often is the right hand column, which lists the local reentry council members. Um, I, I hope you can see it, um, but it is pretty comprehensive and it can really guide you to ensure that you have strong representation on your council uh, because as you know, Having these various perspectives is critically important to um, running an effective council. And so whenever possible, get as, as many different perspectives um, and stakeholders at the table from these different areas. And of course, it's always helpful if you can have a representative that can influence decisions at their agency um, or is a decision maker as well. Um, and I'll be very transparent, this work is not easy. It has not been easy, especially serving a tri-county uh, area. We have a large geographical location. Uh, the counties we serve are rural. And so our general recommendation would be unless you are working in neighboring communities or counties which already work very closely together, if you can um, form a single county or single community reentry council, that would probably be um, ideal just for logistical um, pragmatic reasons. So this is a model that we follow loosely. We have adapted it throughout the years to work in the communities we serve. At this point, we do have those strong partnerships with virtually all of the partners you see listed there. Uh, we also would recommend and have seen success through organizing working subcommittees around different areas of need. So in our community, um, the three highest needs are around transportation, housing, and housing specifically for sex offenders as well, but that's a whole nother presentation, um, and around employment. So we do have working subcommittees around those areas. And I'll share with you just a simple win that we had by having the uh, director of the local public transit on our council. Um, we were able to bring a uh, concern with him that we were noticing with many of our clients not being able to use um, cash transaction after a certain time of the evening when they were trying to get on the bus. And he actually was able to very swiftly and seemingly easily resolve that issue, uh, which was a simple fix, but one that was drastically helpful to many of our clients. Um, we're also working with the local transit authority because um, we may be able to receive a decommissioned vehicle that they're no longer using where we could serve reentry clients and meet some of the transportation needs further out into the county that we serve. Um, so I also want to mention, pull out one other piece from your council, and that is that you want to have at least one person, preferably more, uh, but people who have been through the reentry process, who have successfully transitioned home, make sure you have that representation on your council. These are the true experts, and their perspectives obviously um, need to be represented in order to identify needs and solutions. And so another role of our reentry council is advocacy. And so, actually, if you can advance two slides. Thank you. Um, we have a lot going on in North Carolina around advocacy in the reentry space. We are proud to be a part of the North Carolina Second Chance Alliance, which is an organized statewide advocacy campaign. And so on the left, you'll see um, uh, some of the Second Chance bills, which were introduced during this year's legislative session. Um, the Second Chance Lobby Day happened in May, and we were there, and there were more than 1,000 reentry advocates from reentry councils across the state. And so that picture on the top shows a picture um, from, from our event in May, or from the event in May. And on the bottom pictures, those are, those are our staff and, and some members of our reentry council and a local elected official and clients. Um, there, you can see we were actively there um, advocating for, for these various bills. 
and I'm proud to report that um, the second chance bill did pass fairly easily and with uh, strong bipartisan support. And so um, advocacy is huge. We lean on our reentry council members to um, help us with those advocacy efforts and encourage you to visit this website if you want to check out more about the North Carolina Second Chance Alliance. And I'll also mention that we are engaged in local advocacy as well. So for example, uh, several cities within the counties we work in and um, Edgecombe County have uh, formally banned the box. And banned the box uh, simply meaning they have removed a question on their employment applications around whether someone has uh, a criminal record, and they wait until further into the interview process um, to ask that question. And there's a whole lot of data and good stuff around why that's a, that's a great policy to have. Uh, but if you're not familiar, Google ban the box and learn more about it. But, but this could be low-hanging fruit um, if some of you um, want to have some local advocacy wins. And it also it can be an effective uh, awareness-raising campaign as well. And so we can go to the next slide. I also wanted to share um, our activities around reentry week. So a few years back, uh, the federal government started what's known as uh, reentry week. And many states, including North Carolina, have formally recognized reentry week. And so we take advantage of this week to host various community events all week long. Um, this year, we hosted six events. We had two resource fairs. We had a, um, a, a block party. We have between 200 and 250 come to, people come to those. Um, actually, the picture in the bottom, the bottom middle shows um, attorney, our Attorney General Josh Stein came to our event and various other state level um, officials. We also um, always host a State of Reentry Luncheon, and that's the only event that we host that is not open to the public. It's one in which we in invite uh, specifically local elected officials and other local community members um, and leaders uh, just to share with them and keep them abreast of the reentry activities that we've had throughout the year. Um, what else do we have? Oh, we also hosted uh, an event around our New Grounds Coffee initiative, and I'll briefly share with you a little bit more about New Grounds Coffee as um, one of our fund development streams. And we also had a, a screening of a reentry documentary that we developed, and I'll share with you the trailer to that documentary um, at the end of this presentation. And so we can go to the next slide. And also just wanted to mention the value of having positive press. Um, so these are just some screenshots of a few of the publications we've had. Um, we've probably had more than a dozen throughout the years, but they've been effective in slowly um, just making the public more and more receptive to the idea of providing support to returning citizens. As you probably know, there is a wicked stigma around having a criminal background. And so uh, press, positive press is very, very helpful. And for example, after one of our most recent uh, publications, we received several phone calls from local employers who were asking if they could hire our clients. And so we love that and um, just encourage you as well to take advantage of um, press opportunities. And so that is a bit about our reentry council. Let me talk a, for a few minutes about um, the services, the direct services that we provide. Um, as Ann shared, we also do a risk and needs assessment. And so this shows you um, the questions that we ask to assess recidivism risk. Uh, we use these three questions. This rubric was provided by our, by our funder, uh, the Department of Public Safety. There are other assessments out there, but regardless, you should do some type of risk uh, assessment. Um, you'll see that our risk assessment tool asks about current age, age at first arrest, and the number of prior arrests, uh, because research does show that younger clients who were involved in the justice system starting at a younger age and who have multiple prior arrests 
are more likely to reoffend compared to older adults who may have had their first offense later in life and who have had fewer arrests. So based on this information, we get a number and we're able to assign either low, medium, or high risk of reoffending. Um, and we also conduct a comprehensive needs assessment. And so we can go to the next slide. Um, and here, um, it's exactly what you would think it is. We're assessing needs. Um, I will mention that a trend that we have seen is that, well, all of our clients, virtually all of them um, who are high risk, also have high needs around housing, employment, and transportation. Uh, we also see a trend of many people working to overcome substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, many people may have ended up incarcerated due to untreated substance abuse or mental health issues. And um, unfortunately, often people might not get the treatment that they need while they are, um, while they are incarcerated, or if they did receive treatment, uh, while they were incarcerated, they don't have that care provided post-release. And so we work to uh, fill that gap and assess those needs. Our program coordinator is actually also a substance abuse counselor, so that is very helpful. Um, so we do recommend you know, screening for these issues and having strong partners um, if you can't provide those services internally. Um, so then uh, we look at their risk level and we look at their needs, and that determines um, the type of assistance that we provide. So someone who is low risk and has few needs would just uh, receive job search assistance, some job readiness training, and we'll provide referral services, maybe some um, you know, bus tokens or kind of a minimal level of funded support, but we're really trying to target our resources for medium and high risk individuals who have many needs. And here we provide the comprehensive case management services. Of course, uh, we work with clients to identify uh, their goals, their background, um, and their strengths, and we work with them to develop a plan to self-sufficiency. Um, this just shows the different, uh, different components of comprehensive case management. We do serve returning citizens from state, federal, and local facilities. Um, and I just want to also mention the importance of having good staff, um, having passionate, empathetic, qualified staff who genuinely want to make a difference in the lives of returning citizens is going to make a big difference for your program. Uh, we have awesome staff who provide comprehensive case management to more than 500 clients annually, and they provide referral services to almost another 500 individuals um, each year. And so our case managers share that um, a lot of the people that walk into our doors often benefit from just having the support of their case managers, knowing they have someone they can talk to who's nonjudgmental, someone who will listen to them, someone who's in their corner advocating for them, and who will do everything possible to support their success and inspire hope. Um, so many people walk in our doors so hopeless and dejected, and so having good staff is going to make all the difference. Um, so again, would highly suggest you take the time to, um, to make sure you have strong staff to, to, to run your program. You can go to the next slide. Um, and I don't have time to go through um, some of these success stories here, but I did just want to include some of the faces of success of the people we've served um, throughout the years. And so I'll just, I'll just, um, Move to the next slide, but um, wish I had time to tell you more, more about the people who you just saw. Those are all clients we, we have served. Um, I mentioned a few slides ago an initiative, a uh, fund development initiative called New Grounds Coffee. And this is an initiative we have in partnership with a local roaster in Raleigh. Um, they roast the coffee. They uh, label it for us. It is a custom blend, so the only place you can get New Grounds coffee is by getting New Grounds Coffee, um, but the proceeds support our reentry program, and this has been an awesome public-private partnership, and we invite you to purchase a bag or learn about New Grounds Coffee at newgroundscoffeeforgood.com, uh, but we also have a webinar coming up next week on Wednesday, 
because you actually have an opportunity to sell New Grounds Coffee or have your partners use New Grounds Coffee and your agency can receive 20% off of each sale or each sale that your partner makes. So it could be a great way to um, make a passive income. And again, if you go to the website, you can sign up for the, for the webinar um, to get more information if you're interested. Um, and so just in, in conclusion, I hope you've learned something. I hope this was helpful. But I did want to share with you, if we can, the um, it's a two-minute trailer of the documentary that I mentioned. It's called Come Home. And um, we're actually submitting the full documentary to some film festivals. So the full documentary is not available right now, but the trailer is. So, so thank you for your time, and we can play the trailer. Thank you very much, Christina, for sharing. And we will hand it over to uh, Thelma French, and she will um, talk about her community level change through collective impact. Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the webinar uh, from rainy New Orleans, Louisiana. Total Community Action uh, has been involved, and I guess a ditto to what my previous two colleagues have said. We have been serving reentering citizens throughout our 55-year existence, but most actively in the last 10 to 18 years have we been involved in the organized criminal justice reform and reentry service delivery coordination in our city. Uh, our vision is that we are a catalyst to change and to viable futures for all of our citizens. Uh, can we get into the slides, please? Let me tell you a little bit about 
incarceration in Louisiana. The earlier slides we saw talked about incarceration in the United States. Louisiana had the highest per capita incarceration rates in the nation in 2017 and 2018. Of 100, every 100,000 residents, 816 were incarcerated, which had our incarceration rate being double the national average. We also had one of the highest recidivism rates in the nation, with one in every three persons released being returned to prison within three years. After several attempts at criminal justice reform, in 2017, we were able to get legislative passage of 10 bills creating the state's criminal justice legislation. And as I heard uh, my colleague Christina talk about the North Carolina experiment, I would like to tell you that I know that I, we were successful because of the success of other states and the leadership of the Pew Foundation in helping us get the data to make criminal justice reform a reality. Of those incarcerated in the state of Louisiana, 40% come from five parishes. Three of those parishes surround include Orleans. Uh, our neighbors to the west, Jefferson Parish, which is part of our metro area, and my neighbors to the east, St. Tammany, then the parish of East Baton Rouge and Caddo. Uh, for those of you who wonder what parishes is, are, they equate to counties in the rest of the nation. But because of our French heritage, we are still a parish-based state. 15.9% of the state's convicted felons are from Orleans Parish, which is the city of New Orleans. Next slide. You know our challenge. Uh, in 2013, we began the coordinated effort of working collectively to impact reentry in our city. Uh, under our then mayor's initiative, NOLA for Life, which was looking at crime, murder, and reentry as a continuum to the high cost of criminal justice in our community. Our original working group consisted of over 60 individuals representing 45 organizations. In 2017, along with the passage of our JRI legislation, we transitioned the working group into a task force, which we then certified as a part of our federally mandated criminal justice coordinating council. The task force is committed to promoting collaboration, coordination, and capacity building among our reentry advocates, service providers, and formerly incarcerated individuals. Uh, we work locally, regionally, and statewide. With the passage of our legislation, very similar to the North Carolina legislation, there was a commitment to reinvest a percentage of those funds into the uh, community-based reentry and proactive work in the criminal justice system. Next slide. So what is our collective impact? As our state was moving forward, the Orleans group, we always want to be ahead of the game. We began to really develop our collective impact model. And we started with defining what were our shared goals. We have three shared basic goals. One, to build a community capacity for reentry stakeholders that uses best practices and evidence-based -based research. Secondly, to provide research training and service delivery coordination that ensures that there are no wrong doors for our reentering citizens. And finally, to inform and insist the development of justice reinvestment policies and practices in our state. We also knew that to be an effective collective impact model, we needed to be able to measure and monitor our progress. So our state set a 10-year goal of a 50% reduction in recidivism, and we set a three-year goal of a 35% reduction in recidivism in Orleans Parish. We also set a goal for reunification and stabilization of families. 
as we know, in a state that incarcerated more individuals, we have done significant damage to the families and children of our incarcerated citizens. In 2018, we, in response to the reform legislation, on November 1st, 2018, over 2,000 individuals were eligible for parole or probation because of the re redefined uh, legislative policies. And we were expecting 800 to be delivered to Orleans Parish on one day. So as a task force, we created our own triage team that took up residence at our local parole and probation office, which is where these individuals would report first and began to triage their need in a medical-based triage model to uh, ensure or to try to reduce any immediate recidivism. has expanded and is now being trained and um, implemented statewide in our city. What has been the role of Total Community Action? One, we have been an advocate, the convener, and catalyst for reentry in our community. Uh, we have worked very hard in our role as advocate, not only in adult reentry, but in our juvenile justice reform. As a CEO, I serve as a member of the steering committee, which is the backbone of our collective impact, and as well as a member of the Louisiana Prison Reentry Advisory Board, where we advise the state agencies that create the oversight for the legislation. And we have our local, uh, which is, I guess, a synonymous to the North Carolina Council, uh, La Prista uh, implementation team. Uh, TCA also chairs the two of the steering committee task force, professional development, and the employment working groups. And members of our Opportunity Center staff are active members of the triage, case management, housing, employment, and family reunification working groups. Next slide. To date, since November 2018, TCA has provided comprehensive services under our whole family case management model to 65 reentering citizens. We continue our work with high risk at-risk court-involved young adults, where we have served over 80 of those individuals in the last year in an attempt utilizing the ceasefire Boston model. We also provide outreach and case management services at the following locations in our community, the New Orleans Probation and Parole Office, where our triage services are offered, the Plaquemine Parish our correctional center, which is where we are beginning to implement the statewide reinvestment act services. And this is in reach case management. Our team members go into the prison and are part of the case planning and reentry case planning, working with our clients prior to release. And we are at our day reporting center, which is for those individuals who are on probation who must go to the day reporting center uh, as part of their probation. Our services that have been provided included 30 individuals have completed our comprehensive foundational skills training where we utilize the STRIVE model. Six have received homeless prevention services. Nine have received employment supports, which include clothing, uniform, and supplies. Five have received rapid rehousing assistance and two have received emergency assistance. All 65 have received some form of family support and family reunification services. And I will close with our last slide, which I am proud to state that three members of our Opportunity Center are reentering citizens, and one was honored this year by our Criminal Justice Commission as uh, an outstanding reentering citizen. And they too are core trainers in our STRIVE model. And the other one is our vulnerable populations case manager. We're excited about this opportunity because as we believe 
We are helping people change their lives, and we are determined that if we can help re- reunite more families through collaboration, partnership, and collective impact, we can reduce recidivism in our community. And I thank you for your attention. All right, well, thank you very much to all of our presenters for today. Um, great to hear about the different um, Ring Tree program models that are happening across the country. Um, we want to go ahead and open it up for questions now. And I see that we do have a few comments and questions that came in during the presentation. Um, so we'll go ahead and turn to those first. But um, anyone out there that has a question or a comment, please feel free to type those into the chat box um, or the Q&A box and we'll be sure to address those. Um, so first we just had, um, let's see, we had an additional statistic here that was submitted in the Q&A box that I'll share. Uh, it says the United States is the world's leader in incarceration. Um, the U.S. is 5% of the world's population, but holds 25% of the world's incarcerated people. Um, there's 2.2 million people in the nation's prisons and jails, which is a 500% increase over the last 40 years. Um, so those are just to complement some of the statistics we read earlier. Um, there's another program that helps high-risk women called Truth Be Told. Um, so it, for other models that you all are interested in out there, you might look that one up. It's called Truth Be Told. Um, it's been very successful in breaking the root of behaviors and reentry. Um, and then we had a question here about what is being done about finding second chance employers. Uh, I know this question was asked early on, and so some of this might have been addressed through some of the presentations, but um, we had someone comment that without those, employer contacts often have no response. So I didn't know if the different panelists wanted to comment on this and um, provide any additional information about what's being done with finding second chance employers? Um, I would like to start with that because one of the things that we did in our comprehensive community assessment prior to submitting our, our competitive grant for criminal justice reinvestment funds was to identify that uh, employment was one of our biggest gaps in services. We've been working with our business uh, alliance to look at a transitional jobs model because we know immediate connectivity to work is key to reducing recidivism. And we've visited CEO and we are looking to uh, possibly have CEO, uh, which is a transitional jobs initiative out of New York, which has gone nationally to set up a site in our community. Additionally, our public leadership has made a call, uh, our city council banned the box about four years ago, but we have had the support of our uh, municipal leadership at increasing the uh, opportunities for employment. But more specifically, we're looking at state uh, contracts. Uh, Louisiana is going to be a large recipient of coastal reinvestment funds, and we're working with the correctional institutions to provide training in those opportunities where we don't have barriers to employment because of our convictions. And so we are working very intentional because often training, uh, prison correctional institutions provide training in areas that when the uh, individual is returned home, there are significant barriers to uh, employment. So on the advocacy side, we're trying to work very closely with them to provide training and certifications in areas where there are opportunities and employers waiting. All right, thank you, Thelma. I'll, I'll mention as well, um, you know, relationship building. So part of the job of our reentry coordinator is to go out and have materials and information and really have those conversations with employers. Um, and then if you are able to secure employment for one of your clients, make sure you send a client who is job ready. 
Um, that's critical. That We've had instances where if you send people who are job ready and do a great job, um, that provides opportunities for others. It really does have a trickle effect um, across organizations. A lot of times it can be easier with employers who are – who aren't so corporate in structure because sometimes when there are so many levels having to go up the chain, there are just corporate hard and fast decisions make where they kick people out um, and they don't really give people a chance to explain themselves. Um, but if there are more locally based employers or those who aren't so kind of rigid in a corporate structure, you might have better luck there. We've also had success partnering with our local employment offices. In North Carolina, it's called NC Works, but it's our local employment office. Uh, they have a database of a bunch of employers and can often lead you in the right direction in terms of which ones may be more um, you know, receptive to this population. And then again, I would encourage you, this is a longer term goal, but uh, raising awareness about banning the box um, I think that would be that would be helpful as well. All right, thank you, Christina. Okay, well, we'll move on to a couple other comments um, and questions that we have. So we did have another comment uh, about the language that's being used for um, you know what we call people who are formerly incarcerated. Um, and so there's, um, you know, people have said that there's ex-offenders are often, um, is often a term that's offensive to people. And so using, um, people often prefer being, um, you know, referred to as formerly incarcerated or people of lived experience um, rather than using the term ex-offender. So that's just a, something that for everyone to keep in mind, um, you know, as they're working on this in this sort of, um, in this sort of work. Also, we had a question about um, are any of the presenters using any evidence-based um, approaches in the service delivery, in the delivery of your program services? And if so, what are these? So I'll repeat it again because I kind of stumble on that. But are any presenters using evidence-based approaches in delivery of your program services? And what are these? This is Ann with Virginia Cares. We're using mm -hmm. the Cary Guide. Um, it's an evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy program that um, is similar in approach to Thinking for a Change, which was developed uh, by the National Institute of Corrections for uh, the Virginia Department of Corrections. And both being CBT um, programs, they work on changing or modifying the thought processes on dealing with the different um, um, issues that can come out of family situations, employment situations, and and that type of uh, of uh, programming that and that's what we use. It's the carry guides was a little more flexible at the time that we were looking to have an evidence based program, and the um, thinking for a change was more geared towards individuals who were mandated at attendance. So since we are a volunteer program, voluntary program, we, we went with the carry guides. Okay, thank you. Any other presenters have thoughts on that? Um, we use a, all of our case managers are, are trained in what's called um, moral, moral recognition therapy. Um, so moral and then recognition, which is not a word I use often, but it's R-E-C-O-N-A-T-I-O-N. Um, and it involves a cognitive behavioral treatment for um, substance abuse, um, people challenged with substance abuse issues and also for individuals uh, transitioning back home. So you can look into that as well. It's evidence-based. Okay, great. Um, we also use uh, risk needs responsivity, R&R. &R. It is actually a evidence-based model that we are using from corrections all the way through reentry. Uh, the case plan begins now with the those individuals who are in the first year of our uh, criminal justice reform at intake, then week two, as it's called, is developed as, uh, as they go to the correctional center in preparation for reentry. And this is where we're doing the joint case management 
And once the individual returns home, uh, week three is done, and uh, our case managers follow that. For our younger adults who are court involved, but who are not, well, pending, um, they may be out on uh, R&R or release, we are, as I stated earlier, following uh, David Kennedy's uh, ceasefire Boston case management model, which is an intensive case management model that also includes a risk assessment and all. But all of our programs are undergirded with our whole family approach. So we are members of the whole family uh, two gen com community of practice, and we basically use the, use and implement the Aspen Ascend model of working with the entire family. All right, thank you. Um, had another couple of questions here. Um, one is about how are your programs funded? We're funded through the North Carolina Department of Public Safety. We've also gotten some other um, state funding from the Governor's Crime Commission, and we received seed funding for our New Grounds Coffee Initiative from the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. And Virginia CARES is funded through um, the Virginia General Assembly. Uh, we're a line item in the governor's budget. In addition, we receive some um, a small amount of um, community service block grant funds to support the program. Total Community Actions uh, Case Management Model and Opportunity Center are basically funded our community service block grant. We also are WIOA recipients that support our workforce development and foundational skills. We have a Kellogg grant through our business alliance where we are one of four agencies that receive funding to cover our STRIVE curriculum. Uh, but my staff are all funded out of our community service block grant funding. Uh, our community reinvestment funds, our local grant, when we prioritize the needs, uh, most of the partners leverage their case managers so that we could have additional funding for a transitional specialist to coordinate the backbone work and to provide professional development training and employment support. Uh, and we committed that every year that we're able to apply for funding, we will go through the ranking and assessment process to identify what are the needs in the service model that need to be gapped. So we, we have no direct funding from the state criminal justice system. All right, and then another question we had um, is, what services are included in the pre-release component of the programs? I know this one came in, I believe, while Thelma was talking. Um, yeah. Uh, we are doing pre-release and in-reach. So our case management team goes uh, to the correctional facility. Uh, and I, I guess I need to put a little cognizant on that. Uh, we would have hoped that our uh, participants in the criminal justice reform uh, community uh, entry grants would have been housed in their parishes where they would be returning. But for some other reasons, uh, our local uh, parish jail is in a consent decree order. So our returning citizens, as well as those for just a parish who are in this pilot, are actually housed in a rural parish. So it's about a two-hour trip. And our case management team goes down every Monday. They do case planning. They meet with the uh, uh, participants. They do the initial screenings. They start barrier removal. Our legal partners go in to start to deal with some of the uh, legal issues. Uh, we are one of those states that you can acquire a whole lot of fines and fees while you're incarcerated. 
Your license may be suspended. You may have some attachments because you couldn't get to court because you were incarcerated. So that was one of the prioritizations in our comprehensive application. So we have a legal team that goes along with them to start to begin to remo remove those barriers for the participants in our uh, CRI grant application. We also do housing planning uh, for those who are unable to return home or to have a permanent, uh, a transitional residence. So we begin to start to identify transitional housing and our HPRP grant, it, we have two priority populations and returning citizens are one of those. So we, begin, we can begin to start to identify transitional housing or post-release housing during our in-reach services. In North Carolina, unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to do kind of comprehensive pre-release um, work with our clients, but we do partner with, um, there are case managers that work with inmates pre-release. Um, every person has to have a home plan developed. Uh, our experience has been that some facilities do a great job and have really great staff working with people to help them transition, and we can work with them very, very well to help a smooth, uh, promote a smooth transition, but other facilities are kind of awful at providing those services. So we simply don't have the capacity, unfortunately, to do, uh, to do that with the bulk of our clients, but we do go into the facilities and do so that at least the um, you know people know where to find us. They have our information, and we do make sure that all of the facilities and that all of our probation and parole offices. We we do enrollments um, similar to my colleague. We do enrollments at the probation and parole offices um, so that clients don't have to have the burden of trying to get transportation or make an extra trip to our office. Um, so um, most people who leave, um, you know, are transitioning home in North Carolina, most of them are on some level of supervision. So we're able to capture um, most people simply by partnering with the probation parole offices. And we hope to do more work uh, pre-release um, in the future. All right. Thank you all for that. And I think we'll take, um, Really, I just have mainly one more question I think I've seen come through. We have a few comments in the Q&A, um, and I'll try to kind of read through those towards the end uh, before we get to our concluding announcements. Um, but one question that came through the chat that I thought would be good for each of you to answer in conclusion is, um, how do you get started with this work? What, what would be your one piece of advice um, in getting started? Uh, I guess I'll jump in since I'm not. <laughs> I think that um, one of the easiest ways to get started is to look who you're serving right now and to know your agency's capacity and where are your strengths. And uh, I think, as has been stated uh, by uh, Christina, we were already serving these uh, reentering citizens. They were coming through as members of households that we were assisting, be it in LAHEAP, food pantry, uh, any of the other services that we provided, Head Start. And so beginning to find who you're serving now, what are the services you're providing, and then looking who else is doing this work in your community. One of the tasks that I assumed on the task force was the convening of the faith base, because we all know that the faith community has been doing prison ministry since faith community. But we wanted to know how many of them were doing post-relief services and to make sure that they were coming along with us in the criminal justice reform. So if you're not, even, if you're not at a point where you're ready to deliver actual services as community action, be the convener. Be the one that's helping to bring pieces together to make sure they're all part of the community, know what's going on, and have an opportunity to be a part of making change. And I always, I decided that I would focus on the community level impact because I 
consistently hear people talking about how can we make community level impact when we have such small, you know, we don't know where to get started. Or it's hard and difficult to move a community. And I think that just beginning to look at who you're serving and what the conditions in your community are, what are the basic needs uh, from your needs assessment is a good starting place. I have to agree with that. Um, I think the most important thing is, is pulling your community stakeholders together um, because you have, there'll be individuals with varying amounts of experience in the reentry field um, and, and to sit down all at the table at one time and discuss what's needed in your community gives you a, a better foundation, especially when you start to reach out for funding sources um, to support what you're trying to put together. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if I have much to add to those comments. All right, well, thanks to each of you. And we had um, a few comments come in the question and answer um, just about how people appreciate this uh, presentation and appreciate the presenters, um, you know, applauding each of you and um, in your hard yet important work that you're doing with the different models. Um, so just wanted to share that out, um, you know, as it seems like this was a good uh, webinar and some information to share out. Um, so thank you to our presenters. I'll go ahead and pass it back over to Amy, and she'll close us out with some concluding announcements in our last couple of minutes. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you again to our presenters. So here we have all of our upcoming webinars. Um, as you can see, July 17th is our next one um, with Dr. Shervington about healing is the revolution, why trauma work is equity work. And July 24th, the basics of sustainability and resource development. July 31st, we have one on energy partnerships. And then August 7th on rural transportation. And you can find those on our website where you can also register. And also on our website, and um, as well as contacting our Learning Community Resource Center staff. We have training and technical assistance. Um, the partnership offers um, these training and technical assistance to meet the needs of the national network. And you can see our topics below on the slide. And then our uh, Community Action Partnership annual convention is coming up in August from the 28th to the 30th. So feel free to go on our website where you can also find more information and register if you are interested in attending for our community action agencies. And then here is our contact information for our Learning Communities Resource Center staff. So you are welcome to contact us for more information or any questions that you have. And once again, this webinar will be, is being recorded and you will um, receive an email with the link to um, look back at this information. So we thank you all again for being here on this webinar, and we look forward to seeing you again in the following weeks. Thank you very much.